Hello everyone, my name is Guilherme and as a partner engineer, I help businesses to unlock the full technical potential of Meta's innovative solutions. Today, we will talk about how to get started with the WhatsApp Business Calling API. We will start by providing a high-level introduction of the WhatsApp Business Calling API. Then, we will cover what are the requirements and the initial setup process. Finally, we will deep dive into the two main use cases for the API user-initiated calling and business-initiated calling. So let's get started. The WhatsApp Business Calling API is a new feature that allows API businesses on the WhatsApp business platform to enable bi-directional calls on WhatsApp. It's a voice-over internet protocol solution, meaning that the calls take place over the internet as opposed to telephone lines. In order to set up a call between two parties, there are two types of data exchanged, signaling and media. Signaling data are short messages exchanged between the parties to set up the call. Some examples of such messages are incoming call, call accepted, and call declined. Media data is the actual audio content of the call. WhatsApp Business Calling API uses either HTTPS or SIP as the protocols for signaling and the WebRTC protocol for media. A business call usually has two legs, from the user to the business, and from the business to the agent who will talk with the user. The first leg usually runs on the public switched telephone network, or PSTN, while the second leg usually runs on the voice over internet protocol, or VoIP. The WhatsApp Business Calling API is a new alternative to the leg between the user and the business. For the leg between the business and the agent, it's usual to have a contact center to distribute the call to an agent. The WhatsApp Business Calling API does not provide such functionality, so business will need to use their existing distribution product for that. Let's talk about what are the requirements and how to do the initial calling API setup. First, you need to have an existing integration with the Cloud API, hosted by Meta. You should be familiar with concepts like developer accounts, applications, and webhooks, and permissions. If you're not familiar with these concepts, pause this video and check out the free resources on Meta for Developers website. Second, you need an access token with the WhatsApp Business Messaging permission and the WhatsApp Business Management permission. You can leverage the existing token that you use for messaging that was provided during the Cloud API onboarding. Third, if you choose the HTTPS protocol for signaling, your Meta Developer account needs to be subscribed to the new Calls webhook field. You can do it from your app's dashboard under the WhatsApp section in the configuration page. In case you choose the SIP protocol, this is not required. Fourth, your Meta Developer account also needs to be subscribed to the WhatsApp business account that owns the business phone number for which the calling feature will be enabled. This is also done during the Cloud API onboarding process, so you can leverage it. And finally, you need to enable the calling feature. This feature is disabled by default. In order to enable it, you must make a post request to the slash phone number ID slash settings endpoint, and the business must have a messaging limit of 1,000 business-initiated conversations in a rolling 24-hour period on any of their phone numbers. In the request body, they need to send an object named calling. In this image, you can see that this object has the following parameters. The first parameter we will cover is the status one. When it sets as enabled, WhatsApp's client apps will render the call icon in the business conversation and business chat profile. The second parameter is the call icon visibility. Once the calling status is set to enabled, you can further control the display of the call icon through this parameter. When this parameter is set to default, the call icon will be displayed in both the chat menu, as displayed in the first image, and in the business information screen, as shown in the second image. When it's set to disable all, the call icon is hidden and users cannot make unsolicited calls to the business. The business can still send interactive messages or template messages with a call to action button for the user to call them. Another parameter is the call hours one. You can use it to define what are the available time slots for users to call the business. Any calls outside those hours will be blocked. You can also use it to define time slots when the business is temporarily unavailable, like holidays. Any calls within these time slots will also be blocked. 
The last parameter of the calling object is the callback permission status. Before being able to call the user, the business is required to get an explicit permission from them. When the callback permission status parameter is set to enable, after the user attempts to call the business, the business will automatically receive a permission to call the user back. This is the user experience of a user attempting to call the business and not being answered. In the third image, you can see that a message will be shown on the WhatsApp consumer app notifying the user that the permission was granted. If the user clicks on the message, they can choose to revoke the permission as shown in the last image. In the next section, let's deep dive into how business can receive calls from their customers. We refer to this use case as user-initiated calling. The steps for a business to receive a call from a user and establish a connection with them is the following. First, the user will attempt to call the business from the WhatsApp consumer app. One way they can do that is by clicking on the call icons that are available. This video is an example of an user initiating a call by clicking on the call icon shown in the chat with the business. After they click on the call icon, a confirmation message will pop up and they need to click on the voice call button to start the call. Another way for users to initiate a call is by clicking on the call to action button of a message they receive it. This image has an example of such a message. It can be either an interactive or a template message, depending if there is an open customer service window or not. The business can set a time to leave for this message through the TTL underscore minutes parameter. After the time expires, the button can't be used to start new calls. After the user attempts to call the business, the business will receive a call connection webhook. The structure of this webhook is similar to the structure of the webhook used for messaging through Cloud API. A calls array within the value object of the webhook will contain the call-related fields. This webhook is the signal for the business to establish a call WebRTC connection by making a post request to the slash phone number ID slash calls endpoint, with the action parameter set to either pre-accept, accept, or reject. If the business does not respond to the connect webhook, the user-initiated call will time out and a terminate webhook will be sent to the business. You can see in the example code provided that the webhook will contain an identifier for that specific call through the ID parameter. The business needs to store this information because it will be used in the subsequent API calls. The event parameter will be set as connect. Both phone numbers from the caller and the callee are also provided through the parameters called from and to, respectively. The calls array also contains the session description protocol information within the session object, which is required to establish the WebRTC connection. The SDP type parameter will be set as offer, and the value provided through the SDP parameter follows the RFC 4566. The business needs to respond to the webhook by pre-accepting the call. This facilitates faster call setup and avoids audio clipping problems. They can do it by making a post request to the slash phone number ID slash calls endpoint. As you can see in the code example, in the request body, they need to set the action parameter to pre-accept and provide the call identifier to the call ID parameter. This identifier must be the same one that was previously received. They also need to send the SDP information through the session parameter. The SDP type must be set to answer, and the value provided in the SDP parameter also must follow the RFC 4566. Then, the business needs to wait for the WebRTC connection to be established. Once the connection has been established, the business needs to accept a previously pre-accepted call. The request to accept the call is almost the same as the one to pre-accept it. They just need to change the action parameter from pre-accept to accept. After this step, the call is successfully established and it starts. Once the call is over, the business can terminate the call by making a post request to the slash phone number ID slash calls endpoint. They just need to provide the call ID and set the action parameter to terminate. Finally, after the call is terminated either by the business or by the user, the business will receive a call termination webhook. 
The structure of this webhook is similar to the structure of the other webhooks previously explained. You can see in the code sample provided that the cause array contains the idea of the code that was terminated, its start and end times, and its duration in seconds. The event parameter will be set to terminate. This is the last step of the process that business needs to follow to receive calls from their customers. Now let's deep dive into how business can call their customers. This use case is also referred to as business-initiated calling. Before being able to call the user, the business needs to get their permission to do so. In order to get this permission, the business can send a call permission request message, which can be either an interactive or a template message. The first image is an example of such a message. The user needs to respond to this call permission request. When the user clicks on the Choose Preference button, they will see two options, temporarily allow calls or not at this time, as you can see in the second image. After they select one option, the message's button text will change accordingly. To ensure optimal user experience, business can send a maximum of one permission request in 24 hours and two permission requests in seven days. This limit resets when a connected call takes place between the business and the user. Once the permission is granted, the business can make up to 35 connected calls over a seven-day period before having to request permission again. And it can make up to five connected calls per day. The permission can be revoked by the user at any time. Missed or rejected calls might signal that the user is not interested in receiving calls from the business. Therefore, after two consecutive unanswered calls, the user will receive a message to reconsider an approved permission. After four consecutive unanswered calls, the permission will be automatically revoked, but the user can update this again if they choose to. Similar to the user-initiated calls use case, if there is a customer service conversation window open, the business can send a call permission request through an interactive message. If there isn't an open customer service conversation window, the business can send a template message. You can see in the image some examples of a call permission request sent as an interactive message. In order to send this message, the business must use the same Cloud API endpoint that is used for messaging. They need to set the type parameter to the new value call underscore permission underscore request. Once the user responds to the call permission request, the business will receive a webhook with the response. The structure of the webhook is similar to the structure of webhooks used for messaging in Cloud API. In the code sample provided, you can see that the webhook will contain a changes array with a value object and a messages array which contains the interactive object. This last object contains the information about the user's reply to the call permission request. Its type parameter will be set to call underscore permission underscore reply. The response parameter indicates the user's choice and it can be either accept or reject. The expiration time parameter contains the time in seconds when the permission expires. After the business receives the approval to call the user, it can start a call by making a post request to the slash phone number ID slash calls endpoint, setting the action parameter to connect and provide both the user's phone number in the to parameter and a WebRTC call offer in the session parameter. The SDP type parameter must be set to offer and the SDP parameter must follow the RFC 4566. The business will then receive a call ID as a response to this request. This call ID must be stored to make the other required API calls. Then, the business will receive a call connection webhook. The structure of the webhook is similar to the previously discussed call connection webhook for user-initiated calls. You can see in the code example provided that the information about the call will be sent in the calls array within the value object. The calls array contains the call ID in the ID parameter, and the event parameter will be set as connect. It also contains the SDP parameter, which follows the RFC 4566, and the SDP type parameter that, for the business-initiated calling case, will be set as answer instead of offer. After the call is initiated, the business will receive webhooks related to the call's status. 
They indicate if the call is ringing, accepted, or rejected. The structure of these webhooks is similar to the structure of the messages status webhook sent by Cloud API. As you can see in the code example, a statuses array within the value object contains the call's statuses information. The status parameter can be either ringing for when the call starts ringing for the user, accepted for when the call is accepted by the user, and rejected if the call was rejected by the user. Then, the business can terminate the call by making the exact same API request that was previously discussed for terminating a user-initiated call. As you can see in the code example, they just need to make a post request to the slash phone number ID slash calls endpoint, provide the call ID as the ID parameter, and set the action parameter to terminate. Finally, once the call is terminated either by the user or by the business, the business will receive a call termination webhook, which is also similar to the one received for the user-initiated calls. You can use this sample code as reference for the whole structure of this webhook. The calls object will contain the call ID, and the event will be set as terminate. This step completes the process that businesses need to follow in order to call their customers. It also finishes this technical overview of the WhatsApp business calling API. I hope this presentation has provided you with a comprehensive technical overview of the WhatsApp business calling on Cloud API. After learning all of this, you are ready to start its implementation. If you want to learn about the other features available, such as calls deep links, DTM fee tones, and how to use the SIP protocol for signaling, check out this QR code for all of the details on the developers.meta.com website. Thanks for watching.